Hello everybody, I'm Mark Humes, the Dungeon Master for High Rollers, which is the D&D stream over on the Yogscast Twitch every Sunday at 5pm GMT. And this is my new show, this is a brand new series I'm going to be doing, which is to kind of give my way of doing things and my advice and sort of my opinion on ways that you can get into dungeon mastering to help people who want to start being a dm or gm who want to start playing games like dungeons and dragons etc and this is going to be a whole series on a load of different topics this first episode is very much concerned with the basics so if you're a semi-experienced gm if you've started playing already maybe there's not a lot in this episode for you but you might pick up on a few things you hadn't thought about before it might kind of get the old the old brain cogs going yeah this is just going to be talking about the key things you need to know about being a DM, kind of going over like what is a DM, the core responsibilities as I see them, that sort of thing. But then we're also going to be talking about things you can do before your session, um, whether it's your first or your 75th or your 750th, um, that you can do to kind of prepare yourself and get yourself ready um, and make sure that you have a really fun game. But this is all just my opinion, it's just my advice. I don't claim to be a DND expert or a DM expert. Um, so just take the, you know, this is just my way of doing things. If you want other opinions, if you want to get more advice, if you want to get more help, there's so many great D&D resources out there for you, both on YouTube and on the web. Just some off the top of my head, you've got GM Tips with Geek and Sundry, you've got Running the Game with Matthew Colville, you've got Holly Conrad's Friendly Table, and so many more, not just on YouTube, on the web as well as I mentioned. Um, so loads of advice to go around, so please don't just take my word for it, but hopefully this this new series will give you some uh, tips and advice and things like that as well. In the next episode, we're going to be talking about the differences between running your own custom uh, adventure content, what we call homebrew in the D&D world, um, or running established models, things like uh, Dungeons & Dragons, Tomb of Annihilation, Storm King's Thunder, Curse of Strahd, many other systems have them as well. Um, but basically talking about the difference, you know, which one is for you, what the pros and cons of some of them etc. If there is something that you would like me to cover that I've not mentioned or I've not covered in a, in a previous video up to the point that you're watching, uh, please do let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. It gives me great ideas for new videos. I'm probably going to try and focus on more broader issues, so issues that kind of can help a lot of people rather than specific cases, um, but who knows, I might be able to help out with those individually in comments, that sort of thing. So please, please do comment as well. Um, and without further ado, let's just crack on with it. So what is a dungeon master? I think in a series like this, this is really the first topic we need to cover. In my opinion, a dungeon master is narrator and referee. Some people might say that the dungeon master or the games master is the storyteller. And I think that that is personally a bit of a misconception. It is not just the dungeon master's responsibility to tell the story. It is dungeon master and players working together that create the narrative of the game. It might be the dungeon master's responsibility to create the world, to create the plots of the non-player characters, to create the actions of the monsters, but that isn't the same as creating the story. The conflict, the drama, the, the consequences often come from the players themselves. And so it's important to understand that it's not just the DM's responsibility. To me, the Dungeon Master is responsible for describing the world around the players, narrating the consequences of their actions, they're responsible for the NPCs and the monsters and making sure that they seem real and they adapt to what the players do and the world around them. And then finally, they are there as an adjudicator, a referee to say, you want to do this thing? That's this type of check. Or, hmm, there's no rule for trying to throw a squid into space. I'll try and make it up. And that is kind of their responsibility mechanically. In some cases, the dungeon master might also be responsible for creating the world and the adventure that everything is taking place in. But that is different to being responsible for the story. Again, a dungeon master is there creating the world, creating the adventure. That means creating places, creating people, creating those people's motivations, acting on those motivations. Well, if Dark and Thrall, the villainous lich, is trying to raise an army of the undead, how's he going to do that? I'll put those kind of action points and action plans into place and that trickles down. That has, oh, well that means that this village is going to see a rise in these attacks or these bandits are going to increase their attacks as they're being paid by this king and da 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 da. All of these things 
become things that the players can act upon. You don't want to force your players into saying like, well, you're not dealing with Dark and Thrall, the evil lich. Why not? You should go and deal with that. It's giving them the clues that they want to go and do it because then they're the ones driving the narrative, driving the action, driving the conflict. We'll talk a lot more about that stuff, about actually creating plots and campaigns and everything else in future episodes. I don't want to go too deep into it here, but I want it to be something that you think about. It's something that I see a lot of Dungeon Masters struggling with online. My players aren't following the story. I've come up with this epic villain, but the players aren't interested. It's something I see time and time again, and that's where you've got to re kind of rethink how you're approaching your dungeon mastering. Are you creating a world or are you trying to write a novel and these pesky players are getting in the way? Because if you're trying to do the latter one, write a book. It's going to be a lot, lot easier on you. The next thing I'm going to talk about is, again, something which I've seen talked a lot about online and it's kind of because of the rise of popular D&D streams. A lot of people are put off or they seem to be in this mindset that to be a good dungeon master you have to be a professional voice actor, you have to be some incredibly creative writer or you have to come up with these complex plots or amazing puzzles and traps and things like that. You don't. You don't have to be Matthew Mercer, you don't have to be Chris Perkins. You don't have to do these things in that way to be a good dungeon master. To me, being a good dungeon master means your players are having fun. If your players are having fun and they're enjoying themselves and they're getting a kick out of your game, you've done it. You've, you, you are a good dungeon master. Congratulations. You don't have to do funny voices. You don't have to have crazy plots. You just have to make sure that your players' actions matter. And when I say that, I don't necessarily just mean in a big, heavy, role-playing emotion, emotional sense. Some players just want to create a badass character who's good in combat and kick the crap out of monsters. And if you're letting them do that in a cool way and you're still keeping them feeling challenged, you've done a good job. If your players want to progress through a dungeon, get all the loot and slay the big boss at the end and that makes them happy, You've done it. You've been a good GM. There's no right or wrong way to play Dungeons and Dragons, and there's no right or wrong way to DM. It's gonna differ group to group, and it's gonna vary. I've played with tons of groups since I was a kid to now as an adult, and I've played with a whole different group of people. Some people want that emotional connection to NPCs, and they want to explore their character's tragic backstory. Others want to set the village on fire and loot as much stuff as they can and be villains. Some of them want to just go through dungeons and feel clever because they've bested my traps and that sort of thing. All of these were fun games where we had a laugh. None of them were wrong. And that's something sadly I see a lot is a lot of people saying like, oh, you know, oh, how can I make my game more like Critical Role? How can I make my game more like Dice Camera Action or High Rollers or something like that? You don't have to make your game like that unless that's what your players want. If your players are having fun, don't stress. And to help them have fun, just make their actions matter. If they do something in game, give it consequence. If they do a cool trick in combat, but it's gonna one hit your big bad bad guy. Don't dismiss it. Don't sort of say, oh no, it doesn't work because of reasons. Let it happen. Make that player feel cool. You've got to balance this, and this is something we'll talk about in a second, but ultimately that player is gonna walk away from that table feeling so good. And that will make you feel good too, trust me. When you sit down to be a dungeon master, especially for the first time, it can be a little intimidating because you think, Oh, I need to know all these rules. Oh, God, look at all these books. I need to know it all off by heart. You really don't. Don't stress about knowing how every spell or every class ability works. Don't worry about knowing the intricacies of underwater combat, especially if you're not thinking that it's going to come up anytime soon. Instead, what I would recommend is focus on the core basics of whatever system you happen to be playing. Know how players can make attacks. Know how they can do other non-combat actions. Because if you understand these core basics, it lets you 
come up with things on the fly much more quickly and smoothly. It will help you be more confident in your improvisational skills. When a player comes up with some bizarre thing that they want to do, yeah, I want to like balance a plank over a barrel and then I'm going to summon a bear 20 feet up in the air and then it's going to land, it's going to launch me like a springboard up so I can stab the dragon in the chest and I'm going to grab... If a player comes up with that thing, there's not always going to be a specific rule for that situation. But if you understand the core basics of the game, you can break it down and say, okay, well that's going to be this type of skill check. I'm, it probably makes sense for him to make this type of thing. Then it's going to be this, then it's going to be that, and then we'll resolve it that way. If you can do that super quick and off the top of your head, it will make combat and actions go way more smoothly and you'll be more confident. There has to be a certain level of trust between players and Dungeon Master and Dungeon Master and players. It's okay that if a player says, oh, I'm going to cast Stinking Cloud, and you don't know what that spell does, how does that work? Oh, well, it's a 20-foot cube, and it does this, and they make a saving throw, and they take this much damage. You can just say, okay, if that's what you say it is, that's what happens. If you get a player who's cheating, who's deliberately lying to you, that is a serious problem that you need to discuss out of the game. That is a communication issue. That is a player not understanding that the game's intent is not to win. The game's intent is to have fun. If they're doing that, the group's getting annoyed, that is a problematic player that you need to talk to out of game. In reality, what you should be able to do is just say, yeah, sure, if that's how it works, go for it. They'll just describe the spell and it keeps things moving. It's even better if you can encourage your players to learn their character, learn how their spells work, learn how their character abilities work. Not everybody's going to do this, but it will certainly help. And it means that there's less stress on you as the Dungeon Master to always get everything right. Likewise, it's totally okay to make a snap judgment in a game and say, I'm not really sure how this works, let's make it a this check for now, I'll check it later. Keep that game moving. Trust me, nothing kills a game of D&D more than when you're like, hang on, uh, uh, looking it up, looking it up. So you want to slide down the balancer and you're going to strap, you're going to tie daggers to your feet with your belt and then you're going to slide down and you're going to stab the orc in the face. Okay, hang on, let me look this up. At which point the player might turn around and say, ah, no, screw it, I'll just walk down the stairs and attack. Eh, boring. You've just robbed the group of a cool moment because you had to look something up. If you just go, ah, I'm not really sure how that will work, but make this type of skill check and then make an attack, but do this damage. Sure, we'll do that. I'll look it up later. And then you look it up later and you go, mm, actually, it should have been this type of check and I probably should have made the damage this instead. When you sit, when you next see that player, just say, hey, next time we do something like that, it, it'll work more like this because I figured it out. Blah, 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 blah. Likewise, you know, if there's another ruling, a spell, you can look it up later and then just retrograde it and communicate the next time you sit down to play. That ties nicely into kind of my last little piece of general advice here, and that it is absolutely okay to make mistakes. As a GM, you are going to, at some point, make an encounter too strong. You're going to give away too many magic items or too few magic items. You're going to probably have a problematic player or an argument about a ruling. These things are all going to happen. You might have a player who's feeling a bit left out. You might not give a player as much attention to their backstory as you would have liked. All of these things will happen to you at some point and it's absolutely okay. We've all done it. All the dungeon masters that have come before you, like generations of the Avatar cycle, we have all made these mistakes, okay? Don't worry about them. You go back, you revise it, you see what you should have done, you come back, and here is the biggest thing for new GMs and new D&D groups or new role-playing game groups, you need to communicate. This is the number one problem I see, both online, on Facebook groups, in YouTube comments. Oh, I had this player do this, and now we're in this situation, or I got this wrong, and now this player thinks I'm against them, blah, blah, what do I do? The answer is communicate. Talk to that player. Talk to the group. Explain the situation. Hey, I'm really sorry, guys. I messed this situation. I messed this ruling up last week, which meant that such and such died, or such and such lost their magic item. I got it wrong. I'm really, really sorry. I don't want to go back and change it, because that's kind of you know, that would be a huge, massive effort, but I'm going to make up to it in some way, or what, how do you think we can go about it? You know, do you want me to power up this? Shall we do a, you know, do you guys want to do this? Blah, 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 blah. Communicate, talk about the problems. 
we can talk a little bit more about specific solutions and things like that and ways that you can kind of suggestions that you can make in later episodes but i just want you to know that it's okay to make mistakes that you just need to talk to your players and you'll be able to resolve it and that's really kind of like going to wrap up i'm going to wrap that little section up on a sour note because we're going to move on to some other more positive stuff uh, just some ways that you can help prep and things like that but those are just some general things i want you to know as a new gm okay so hopefully they help Let's talk about ways that you can prepare for your first D&D game or generally your D&D games or your RPG games in general. Right, apologies that this section is looking quite dark. I haven't quite figured out how to do lighting with a super reflective whiteboard, but I bought this whiteboard and I want to use it, all right? I want to use it. I'm going to use it. So this section is I'm going to talk a little bit about some things you can do before your game that will help you out. Just some things to think about, especially if this is your first game, some things that you want to sit down, figure out, okay? The first one, this is a pretty big and obvious one. If you're an ex if you regularly play, this one doesn't really matter to you, um, but it is choose how, when. So basically choose how and when you want to play. D&D doesn't have to be relegated to the dining room table and the basement anymore. With so many wonderful online tools out there, you've got things like Roll20, Fancy Grounds, even things like Discord or Google Hangouts. You can get a bunch of people together online from all over the world and play, which means that you just need to find a group, figure out how you're going to play. Is it going to be in person? Is it going to be online? And then figure out a time when to actually sit down and play as well. And that's actually a big one. A lot of people, you know, they might turn around and say, like, oh, let's play every 6 p.m. on a Friday. If one person is always struggling to get to that, is always arriving late, push the session back a, bit, a little bit if you can. You know, figure out a time that is good for everybody. If you're all night owls, if you're all staying up until 2 a.m. in the morning and you can comfortably run and, and have a game at those hours, do it. But if you're trying to take part in a D&D game at 2 in the morning and you're living at home and your parents get really mad at you and things like that, maybe don't play in that game or at that time. Ask if you can play a little bit earlier. Ask if you can play on a weekend. See what you can figure out, okay? So it's actually something to consider. The next one is, and this is a big one for me, is get to know your players. Um, what I mean by this is, like we mentioned earlier on, different people want different things out of Dungeons and Dragons or other RPGs. Spend some time talking to those players. Ask them if they're experienced players or if they've played a couple of games, what kind of games do you want to play? Ask them, do you watch? Do you love Critical Role? Do you love Dice Camera Action? You know, what kind of D&D have you played in the past? Figure out what their goals are. If they're like, oh, I just want to fight stuff or like, oh, I love dungeons then you've got a good idea that like, if you put a dungeon in, that player's gonna have fun. You might need to do a little bit of finagling. Some people might want opposing things. You gotta find a way to balance that. That's kind of the whole thing of you know, becoming an experienced GM is learning how to do that. You can also spend some time, if you've got all brand new players who don't know what they want um, from a Dungeons and Dragons game, that's okay too. Basically sit down, give them a, a broad first experience. Give them a bit of role playing, give them a bit of a mini dungeon, give them some cool encounters, see what they pick up on, see what they enjoy. You'll often find that new players are also the most experimentative. They'll actually try things, they won't just stick to like, oh I attack, I attack again because it's the most optimal. They'll try different things, they'll try and find workarounds, that sort of thing. But spend some time getting to know them. This also is very important. You know, get to know the players, ask them, do you have any phobias, do you have anxiety about anything? because then you can avoid that stuff. It seems a silly thing, and I think a lot of old school gamers or old gamers, you know, f folks that come from different generations probably don't think about that kind of thing, but it is something we're becoming more aware of. Mental health is a bigger issue now. Ask them, you know, is there anything you want me to avoid? If they turn around and say like, oh, you know, they might turn around and, and share something with you and say, well, yeah, you know, I had a big issue with, you know, personal abuse and things like that. You know to stay clear of that, you know, or to handle it very sensitively if you do. That's really important. Um, and also just getting to know them because D&D is a social game at the heart of it. It is about spending some time with people, becoming friends with them, all of that good stuff. So, so get to know your players. Okay, next up we have, and this is again a kind of obvious one, prep your content. Um, 
this is an obvious one. You know, if you're homebrewing content, if you're creating your own world, your own adventures, obviously you need to plan that out. You need to figure out what's going on. You need to think about where the players might be going, what they might be doing, all of that good stuff. But it also still applies to running established models, um, modules. Spend some time going over your notes. Make sure you have a clear understanding of where the players are, the kind of things that are available to them, the kind of things they could do, the kind of things that could happen to them. Um, think about pacing. If you're playing a module, think about, you know, well, you know, if they progress quickly, where might they go to? What kind of regions or what plot, plot hooks might they uncover? Have a good understanding of what your players are doing and why. Um, spend some time. Think about what are your villains up to? You know, have they just, have the players just foiled one of their major plans? Maybe this is the kind of time period or the next couple of days they learn about it. Are they going to do anything about it? Think about all these different things. Um, this is the time to really go over your notes, make sure you've got a solid understanding and come into that game fresh and ready and prepared. Really quick one, this one. Uh, this is just a personal thing, which I always do. Make a big list of random names. I now understand school teachers when they were running out of space on the board. This is something I always do. It's really helpful to me. The amount of times players have caught me off guard and say like, oh, what's your name, good sir? When they've been talking to currently nameless NPC that I didn't expect them to talk to, I'll be like, the and you have to come up with a really dumb name that the players will remember and will laugh at you forever. If you've got a big old list of random names, you can just pull one off that. It is a very useful improvisation tool. It is one I highly recommend. Okay, next up we have... Brush up on the rules. So I mentioned earlier in the video, try and have a good core understanding of the basics of the game so you can improvise, so you can plan things around it. Um, and this really ties into that. Spend a bit of time, read through the player's handbook or whatever system rulebook you're using. Make sure you just go over, okay, this is how this works, this is how this works. This is also a good time that if you know that your players are gonna be doing something which has a bit more complicated rules, fighting underwater, for example, or traveling the planes, or doing or piloting a spaceship in, you know, an asteroid field spend a bit of time brush up on the rules think about anything specific that you might need to know about it just gives you that thing of more confidence you'll feel more confident when they try and do things it means that you can answer questions faster it will help speed the game up and everything else just something to consider there um, the next one I'm going to add on here is uh, think about I have to think that what you want out of the game So, this is another important one. Like I mentioned earlier, D&D is about having fun. And you want to think about what your players want to get out of the game. You want to be rewarding them. You want to be giving them the types of content they enjoy. But you also get a right to that. You, as the Dungeon Master, should also be having fun. You have your own goals. You have your own things that you want to include. And that's perfectly valid. So, this is a time to think about what you want out of the game. If you've come up with a cool puzzle or a cool encounter, if you want to help a player accomplish one of their goals, if you've got a cool villain you want to introduce, this is the time to think about, okay, well, how can I do that? Can I get them in this episode? Can I incorporate them somehow? Can I allude to it somehow? You get to walk away from that, that game, whatever you've sat down to play, and have your cool moment too. It could be revealing a long plot, you know, twist that you've had hidden for ages. Um, it could be a super fun encounter that you just come up with crazily at night, a cool puzzle. Whatever it is, think about what you want to get out of the game. Make sure you try and get that in there as well. I think that personally, I would put players first, me second, but there's ways to make sure that you can make players happy and yourself happy at the same time. The last two things now, I'm hoping that the camera's going to catch these. Yeah, loads of space. Prepare your tools. So, tools. What do I mean by that? D&D's progressed a long way since 1977, I think. Uh, or 18, no, 1877? That'd be impressive, 1977. D&D's progressed a long way. Um, we started with, you know, pens and paper and dice. We now have things like iPads, apps, soundboards, 
color, color changing light effects bulbs, miniatures, dwar dwarven forge. These are all what I consider tools. One thing I want to make 100% clear in this first episode. You do not need anything more than dice, pens, and paper. You can play D&D, you can have the best D&D of your life with just those three things. Miniatures, Dwarven Forge, soundboards like Sirenscape, um, dwar uh, light effects bulbs, cool smoke machine, I don't know, whatever it is. These are all lovely optional extras, but they also add their own stress, which is why it's important to prepare them. If you're going to be running miniatures, get out the miniatures you're going to need. Have some spares ready to go just in case you need to pull something out. If you're going to do Dwarven Forge, build the Dwarven Forge beforehand. Nobody wants to sit there with you as a DM figuring out how a room's going to look in Dwarven Forge. Have it ready to go. Take a picture of it so you know what it looks like. Quickly build it whilst everybody grabs a drink or grabs a coffee or whatever it happens to be. If you're playing on digital apps like Roll20 on Fantasy Grounds, you can pre-build your maps, reveal them as they go. Make sure you spend some time to do that. It will give that the players this kind of like, whoa, kind of sense of awe as you reveal it, but it's also gonna save you tons and tons of time. If you're gonna use apps like Sirenscape, build your soundboard out ahead of time. Makes a big difference. Plan when you're gonna change the light color in the room or whatever it happens to be. All very, very cool things. And then the last one, because I don't want to overload you with too much information. Um, the last one is very important. Relax. This ties back into what I was saying in that you're going to make mistakes. Don't worry about it. Every other GM has made mistakes before as well. Make sure you spend some time to relax. If you are stressing about a session, if you're there going like, oh, I hope I've prepared enough, or, oh, you know, uh, I, I, haven't, I haven't done this, or I haven't done that, don't. D&D is meant to be fun. If that's the case, see if you can delay the game. See if you can call the game off, reschedule for another day. If it's coming up and you, don't have, you can't reschedule it or whatever, just go in and let what be, be. If you have to end the session early, end the session early if they run out of the stuff that you've prepared. If you just let them run, let them run loose, give them a few wild goose chases to run around with. As long as it's going to be fun, the players are going to enjoy it. Excuse me. So yeah, so that's the last one is just try and relax. Remember, this is a game about fun. It's about a game of spending time with a bunch of people, getting to know them, hanging out with your friends, having a laugh, telling a story together. So don't stress about it. Try not to stress about it, I should say. Um, and that is it for the whiteboard section of this. I really hope this is visible. It looks fairly visible on the camera. I'm going to do some work to kind of boost it up a little bit. I really hope it works because I bought this whiteboard specifically for this series. Hopefully it will work. And there we have it. That is the first episode of this new D&D Help series. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it's been useful. I know it is starting at the very basics, but I kind of want this series to build up as we go. The next episode, as I mentioned earlier, is going to be covering the differences between running kind of your own personal custom content and running module content and, you know, my advice on those kind of things. Um, after that, we will be moving into creating your, your own campaigns, your own adventures, that sort of thing. But if there are topics you'd like me to cover, I think I have the first sort of nine episodes of this planned out. But if there are topics you'd like me to cover, do let me know in the comments below. I absolutely want to kind of build on this series. Hopefully it becomes a long running thing. People hopefully will enjoy it um, and everything else. If you'd like to support me, and I'm going to spend a bit more, this is more of a casual Mark talking to the camera thing, um, rather than trying to, to be a put together kind of show. If you'd like to support me, there's a number of ways you can do that. The biggest one that I want to kind of talk about is this video series is going to kind of try and become like a staple of the channel. So if you see somebody who's looking for advice on GMing, if you, you see somebody who's like, oh, I'm, you know, I want to play D&D, &D, but I'm not sure please link them to this series. It, whether it's on a subreddit, whether it's in a Facebook group, whether it's on Twitter or, you know, wherever in an email, I don't care. If you can share this video, if you can get this kind of video circulating out there, that would be so, so helpful to me. I feel really bad plugging my own content on things like subreddit. Um, so if other people do it, it makes me feel super, super happy. Um, so I would really appreciate that. Otherwise, if you want to more directly support me in terms of financially and that sort of thing, there's a number of ways you can do it. 
Um, the, one of the key ways is you, you can do merch on store.yogscast.com. It's all in the video link description below. There is high rollers and tabletop weekly merch. I benefit from both of those. Um, if you want to go and buy those, that would be fantastic. And you get something quite nice back from that as well. You can also, uh, I do streaming on Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash tabletop weekly. I currently stream Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays, normally starting around about 8 p.m. Um, at the moment, we're doing a lot of miniature painting, a lot of Warhammer painting, so you can come and check that out. Um, hopefully do some extra bonus streams in the future as well. Um, and we've got sub emotes. We've got all loads of kind of good stuff going on there. You can also check out my Patreon, which again is linked in the video description below. Uh, the Patreon is something I'm building up and I'm going to do more and more with this year. Currently, I post some D&D custom content to it. Um, and anybody who is a $5 tier will get access to my DMs Guild PDFs for free. Um, so you get access to that stuff as well. So you don't have to buy it, which is nice. And you're supporting me. Um, I'm also planning to do more things, um, maybe some audio only podcasts, I'm going to do some D&D help text articles, that sort of thing. So if you want more D&D sort of general content, that's a good place to uh, subscribe or to, to become a patron, I guess. And you can do that there. The last one is I want to promote my friend Steve Cook's Patreon as well. I'm going to link that in the description below. It's going to be near the top. Um, Steve is a wonderful friend of mine. He is part of the Action Hall LARP group. If you've watched any of my LARP videos, you'll know him from that. Um, and he's a wonderful friend. He's a writer and he's just started up a Patreon for his kind of writing projects. Very, very lovely guy. Very, very talented. I'd really appreciate if people could check that out and support him as well. Um, and apart from that, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, the next episode, I'm going to hopefully try and do these every Friday. These videos will come out. So you can look forward to the next one next week. Um, there's plenty more to come to the channel as well. And yeah, thank you very much for watching everybody. I hope this has been useful. Take care and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.